So, hello and welcome to the fourth panel of the Mediating Scale Conference, uh, co-organized by myself and uh, Magdalena Krzysztofowska. My name is Oliver Kenny, and I'm delighted to be chairing this panel today. Just some housekeeping before we get started. Please note that this session is being recorded. The three, pan uh, the three papers in this panel will be presented one after the other, and then we'll have roughly half an hour for questions at the end. So please do post your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom, and we'll try to put as many of those as we can uh, to our speakers. Please try to formulate your questions concisely, and please make sure to use that Q&A uh, feature rather than the chat feature. So I'm going to go straight on to our, our first speaker. This is uh, Andrew Fisher. If you turn on your video, I'll bring you in so we can put a uh, face to a name. So Andrew Fisher is the founding editor of the journal Philosophy of Photography uh, and currently research fellow in photography at FAMU uh, in Prague, working on a project entitled Flusser, Simondon and the Temporal Scales of Contemporary Photography. Prior to this, he was principal investigator on the collaborative research project Scale, Measure and Proportion in Contemporary Visual Cultures, also at FAMU. Uh, much of his recent research has centered on the significance of various conceptions and relationships of scale for the understanding of both historical and contemporary forms of photography. This has resulted in a series of publications, including one called Three Scale Models for a Photographic World, Benjamin, Constellation, Image and Scale from 2021. Um, a chapter in uh, a book called uh, by um, Dvorak and, and Parikat called um, a Photography of the Scale. Uh, that chapter is called Living with the Excessive Scale of Contemporary uh, Photography. And also a chapter in German, the Fotografische Maßstab in Ästhetik des Galion from 2020, um, with, uh, yeah, in Zeitschrift für Ästhetik und Allgemeine Kunstwissenschaft. So, Lots of things to do with scale. Uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to his talk today, uh, which is entitled Flusser, Simondon and the Scales of Contemporary Photography. Andrew, over to you. Okay, so now I need to share my screen. Um, yes. Uh, make sure I've got it right. Okay, so. Is that working? Yeah, that's great. Lovely. Okay. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank Oliver and Magdalena for organizing the conference and uh, also to thank the previous speakers for a series of interesting talks. In this presentation, I'm going to explore the importance of scale for an understanding of photography. And I set out from two premises. Firstly, that contemporary photography is a multi-layered and massively extended milieu of relations that span almost every aspect of human endeavor. The second is that to make, look at, or use a photographic image today is to be confronted by unavoidable questions of scale. When attention has been given to this fact in recent research, and in journalistic accounts of contemporary photography, the focus has tended to be on its overwhelming and expansive size, the excessive horizon of massive and hard to grasp number that seems to define contemporary photography. In contrast, this paper will fo the focus of this paper will be on a plurality, if not a plethora of different experiences, technical forms and understandings of scale encountered in photography. As such, I can only touch on a few concrete aspect, aspects of scale's importance for photography, but I can at least allow one or two images to sneak into my presentation that do things with scale I may not get time to talk about so that the discussion might unfold alongside some hints of its wider field of reference. Like this image, borrowed from a very interesting text by my colleague in Prague, Thomas Dvorak, called Beyond Human Measure. Having said, I'm not gonna be able to talk about these images. I do just want to note that the photographer Garcia Rowland's use of this a very familiar visual strategy, setting something to scale 
um, by inserting a reference object in the field of vision with which to measure it is interesting in the context as its wider political economic context, the wider political economic context of this image problematizes the very ground of reference upon which the strategy of scaling rests. Here, it's the pathetic materiality of the chicken, it seems, and not the banknotes against which it is pictured that sets the standard of measure in this context. As the banknotes, the whole point of them being there is that they're cut loose from the wider system that gives them sense. Back to the talk. My focus on the plurality of scale in and for photography has as its reference point Wilhelm Flusser's concept of apparatus and Gilbert Simondon's concept of milieu. Questions of scale are, are important to both thinkers. Flusser theorizes the photographic apparatus as a matrix of compounded scaling processes that combine to structure the use of photographic equipment and through this, the construction of the visual world. Simon Don's concept of milieu is central to his philosophical analysis, analysis of processes of individuation and the modes of being of technical objects. And the role of this concept is critically oriented by con questions of scale. On these bases, I want to begin an investigation into the contemporary photographic image as an intersection between multiple and interrelated processes of scaling that unfold in a contested milieu of scalability. It's all rather abstract. So in an attempt to provide some concrete markers, I'll start by tracing some compounded questions of scale through a very short sequence of photographs. This one was taken by Robert Frank on, on the 1950s road trip that resulted in his canonical work, The Americans, but didn't make it into the book. It shows a stand of postcards on the counter of a roadside stop in the US state of Nevada, on which we see the Grand Canyon, the Hoover Dam, and an atomic bomb test. The sublime natural landscape, the harnessing of its power by industry and the world threatening destructive force of nuclear weapons are brought down to scale, so to speak, mediated by the postcard, a mass historical form with its own distinctive industrial and geographical horizons of scale. The image plays on the photograph's ability to frame events and objects of far greater size, making explicit the fact that photography's reality effects derive from de- and rescaling what is depicted. Insofar as it is linked with the reality, this image, as Wittgenstein once wrote, quote, reaches up to it. It is like a scale applied to reality, end quote. One can also read out of this image clues as to the scaled conditions of its making. The fact that photographs can be taken to be representations in the first place derives from associated technical processes calibrated to allow setting the appearance of things in spatially and temporally scaled relation to one another. For instance, through the control of focus, exposure, and aperture, or in the case of Frank, famously, through the studiedly casual loosening of such control. So this photograph is saturated with questions of forms of scale. Looking at, in the, looking at it in this way also alerts one to further scaled questions perhaps associated with its canonical status and conventional discursive framing. Other speakers at the conference have already remarked Timothy Clark's essay, Derangements of Scale, in which the story Elephant, about an American man in an existential crisis, driving around in his car worrying about things, is subject to an expansion in the scales of its reading to the point at which this character's individual concerns dissolve and the petrol-driven system of car and road emerge as the story's concrete subjects. I'll have to leave it to you to imagine a parallel critically scaled reading of Frank's photograph and to think of the differently scaled relations it might reveal. Eric Kessel's 24 Hours in Photos comprises 350,000 photographic images culled from social media on a given day and piled to spill into the space of a gallery of the somewhat kind of um, Crude, look, crude seeming frame of the wooden frame upon which they rest. This often referenced artwork has become a conventional and perhaps slightly too neat illustration of the massive and difficult to grasp numerical horizons of contemporary photography. These photographs depict things that were presumably of interest at the moment of their making, but this representational value is reduced for most to material invisibility, for some to a flash of surface color and for a few to fragmented appearances. 350,000 photographic prints is a lot. 
and yet it is tiny in comparison to the horizon it sets out to figure. The installation reaches towards, to recall Wittgenstein, is like an, a scale applied to a broader historical technical situation of photography by projecting a partial element, 24 hours in photos, to evoke the unrepresentable horizon of photography as such. Metonyms are, after all, prime operators of scale. Now, the point of talking about these works, photographs, these instances of photography here, is not to champion their interest over other images and works. Rather, they stand as, as, as quite self-reflexive exemplars of historical moments in which different ideas of scale have collided with each other in a photographic register. My suggestion is that foregrounding these such collisions might grant critical purchase on the conflicted visual worlds that the operations of scale in photography serve to construct. But what about less artfully reflexive photographies? My paper today draws on an earlier article that used this image as a figure, which I, and I think it remains suggestive. It is a black and white screenshot of a photograph found online through a search of the term photographic scale. I have no record of its provenance, it returns no results in reverse image searches, and as such is effectively anonymous. It shows a metal rule, a rude shiv, and a blurred mugshot laid out on the surface of a copy stand, and it has multiple flame, frames of black and white that speak ambiguously of its editorial and material history. On the face of it, this is photography as institutionalized measure. It appears to be the product of an unidentified penal institution's panoptical operation. Shorn of anything but the most generic indicators of context, the image nonetheless suggests itself as the record of a violent event. There is the improvised and stained knife bearing traces of its making or use, the casually placed and propped metal rule against which it was measured, and the mugshot of a man holding a blurred out name board to his chest. These representational aspects in this kind of act of measures appear to, you might on the face of it, appear to exhaust the character of the image. But the point is that the, the different modes of scaling, scale and scalability involved, I, I think should, should be given space to come to the fore. The man depicted has, perhaps as a condition of the image's relief, release, been obscured by the addition of a digital filter, a blur superposed on his image's reproduction. So at least two photographs and two material processes entailing the considered application of calibrated visual effects are here compounded in the visual surface of this screen image. Its openness to being de and rescaled is patent in the various frames that now form part of the image, the casually cut white borders of the mugshot, the vertical white strip at the left-hand side and the black bands at top and bottom, all speak ambiguously of different contexts of use and appropriation of different materialities and acts of measuring calibrating, resizing, or otherwise scaling, the authors of which could have been people or automated processes. This image, now definitively buried amongst the billions of others to follow it, offers itself to be read through a range of different processes, facts, and conditions of scale, which combine to structure what one might see in it, know or not know of its original or subsequent uses. My discussion of it here is as a banal exemplar of this fact, that is meant to encourage you to reconsider other aspects of photography in which so, such questions of scale may not be so obvious, even though they are determining. Here's another image that has snuck into the talk. Martha Rosler's 1965 photo montage Cargo Cult, which stands in interesting, but I'm afraid to say in this talk will have to remain just ambiguous in critical contrast to the treatment of photographic objects, modes of image circulation, and the ideas of aesthetic agency encountered in the images seen so far. In the time remaining, I turn to Flusser and Simondon as offering theoretical models through which to articulate these compounded relations of scale. This may involve dwelling on ideas or writings that are overly familiar for, to you, but the claim is not that they are novel in the context, but rather that they might help in articulating and evaluating a speculative proposition arising from my observations so far, namely that there is no photography at all of any kind without there being this mixture of different and compounded relations of scale, and that this uh, fact is significant. Flusser's writings are oriented towards understanding the expansive technical material and organizational processes that he denotes by the term apparatus. As such, in Towards a Philosophy of Photography, he writes, and I quote, 
of a new of a new kind of function in which human beings are neither the constant nor the variable, but in which human beings are apparat human beings and apparatus merge into a unity. Sorry for garbling the quotation. His account of the photographic apparatus thematizes the photographer's, photographer's relation to their equipment, a relation that unfolds only within the possibilities offered by the apparatus. The realistic effects that play across the surfaces of resulting images serve to obscure these apparatic conditions, which encourages a visual culture dominated by redundant and instrumental images. Fusser equivocates over this overdetermination of this instrumentality, sometimes leaving open the possibility that the apparatus might be subverted, sometimes not. Either way, the whole drama of the photographic apparatus for Flusser turns on the concatenated operations of scaling. He sees as defining camera operator pairing and determining what is made of their products. He articulated a broader notion of the apparatus as an explicit question of scale in a chapter of the book, Post History, entitled Our Shrinking, written in 1981, which describes processes of scaling D and rescaling associated with technically articulated social relations. Contrasting the gigantic proportions of modern apparatuses with the movement towards miniaturization, his example is the microchip, uh, the, soup, the, the, the microchip, sorry, and the wider operations it, it enables. He criticizes the tendency to see in small scale economies of relation, an alternative to what he calls the large scale megalomania of the apparatus. Flusser observes acutely that the kinds of autonomy promised by intelligent instruments equipped with mini programs are always already subscribed in a totality to the effect that small scale possibilities are determined by the way they quote work within and function of gigantic work within and in function of gigantic apparatuses end quote as he writes elsewhere in the book in such an environment we are all played players quite famously and this is a multi-level game that jumps scales between material objects, technical possibilities, personal desires, and cultural values to confuse and obscure the relation that all of the parts of the game have to the total processes of its apparatus. In this context, scale our relations, structure apparatuses, and the uses they allow. But while the relations thus established and the different orders of mag magnitude they entail operate alongside each other, they are not necessarily commensurate with one another. Little subjective freedom is allowed for here, except for that which might result from informed engagement with the technical forms of an apparatuses that Flusser thinks might lead to their critical reorientation at a more general meta level. But even given this suggestion, it is not clear, clear that he provides a way out of the scalar dilemma he diagnoses. Elsewhere, Flusser returns to thinking about scale quite frequently as in the essay, Orders of Magnitude and Humanism. And in reading through this quotation, as we're about to do, one might, might well bear in mind the after image of Rosler's critical feminist photo montage. Flusser writes, man is the measure of all things, of course. That was easy for the ancients to say, then everything in the world could indeed be measured. What was not measurable thus was unmeasurable. Things that were big, without measure had to be worshipped. Things that were small without measure could be held in contempt. We cannot afford this anymore. We are forced to differentiate between orders of magnitude. This is a narrative of discovery and loss that destroys the balance between what is commensurable and incommensurable, what is constitutive of the human in contrast to the, the divine for Flusser here. He continues, in this, the human order is one among many. Humanism is inappropriate to the present. And it turns out, a metonym of the photograph, photographic apparatus, the lens, provoked this displacement for Flusser. The lens is to blame. It, had, it made visible small things on the surface of the moon so that it became difficult to admire the size of the moon. It made visible great things in human semen so that it became uncomfortable to hold it in disgust and contempt. The present apparatuses with the machines and instruments that are based on them are descendants of the lens. However, the lens alone does not bear the blame for the penetration of inhuman orders of magnitude into concrete everyday life. My point here is not belatedly, yet again, to bury one or other notion of humanism. I think something in Flusser's narrative here of scale is informative in the present context and in relation to photography. 
The cosmological and microscopic scales of things brought into the range of human vision, both spatial and temporal here, explode the proportionate space time of the world he contrasts to technological modernity. Now, humanity must come to terms with its finite self-consciousness of the multiple scales, the many frames of reference in which it is compelled to view itself after it's fallen into finitude. Note in this analogy of nested Russian, Russian dolls here, that these diverse scales are only initially commensurate with one another. Flusser not only goes on to stress the differences between orders of magnitude, the different objects or worlds revealed at different scales, but crucially also the fraught play that ensues between these. To quote, the dolls are not, not only contain one another, they are each also permeable by the other. It is especially those gray zones between the orders of magnitude that set our teeth on the edge, end quote. Not only do different scales reveal different objects, but the ability, indeed the necessity of moving between them reveals their disjunctive perspectives to permeate each other in unanticipated and discomforting ways. With this, we return to the unattributable copy stand screenshot image that I've argued is a banal exemplar of an ever present and mutable combination of scaling processes, facts of scale that combine to shape the photographic image. I'd like to think of this in terms of Flusser's pithy phrase, those gray zones between the orders of magnitude that set our teeth on edge. As this foregrounds something that is perhaps distinctive about the photographic, or at least that I want to draw out uh, today. And perhaps this is that, perhaps it is that what sets the teeth on edge here is not an openness to radically uh, expanded or, or reduced scales of interpretation, to an abyssal encounter with the ungraspably large or vanishingly small, at least not in the face of it or totally. What I glimpse in this context, in this image, is what one might call the promiscuous dullness of its compacted functions, possibilities, and facts of scale. This opens onto a very particular kind of abyss, one that doesn't encourage one to look into it and is accordingly often elided in favor of the grandeur of a large scale or the fascinations of microscopic difference. My intuition is that the significance of the necessarily compounded scales of photography that I've attempted to articulate resides in something like this gray area and the scruffy, maybe dirty modes of permeability that entails between the functions, expectations, and ideas associated with and structuring of photographic images. To be clear, this is in no way an argument for a, or a call of order asking for a return to the meso scale as opposed to the micro and macro or other figures of expansion uh, or, or reduction in scale. It is, I suppose, an observation to the effect that these other scales and their grandeur and their fascinations uh, perhaps crop up in ways and in places that are not anticipated, if it makes at all sense to say this. In the time remaining, and working towards an ending, I will change tack and turn towards Simondon in order to approach the issues discussed so far from a different but related perspective. As will more than likely be familiar, Simondon's philosophy takes individuals to be processes of individuation and not static beings. Individuation is characteristic of physical processes and living organisms of different complexity, including human beings, as well as of technical, object, technical objects. In this context, as Muriel Coombs has it, quote, no individual would be able to exist without a milieu that is its complement, arising simultaneously from the operation of individuation. For this reason, the individual should be seen as but a partial result of the operation bringing it forth. Thus, in a general manner, we may consider individuals as beings that come into existence as so many partial solutions to so many problems of incompatibility between separate levels of being. And it's this last uh, phrase, this uh, so many partial solutions to so many problems of incompatibility between separate levels of being as a kind of a, uh, a, a kind of a, a gloss on this, this, the idea of individuation thought of in a photographic context that, that I want to bear in mind in what follows. And in this, an initial observation strikes me. I think it's fairly easy to imagine what would stand on the side of the milieu in this model if one were to try and articulate it photographically. But what stands on the side of the individual? As a term subjected to the relativizing conception of individuation as process, the answer is frankly unclear, to me at least. What occupies this place would not be predetermined necessarily and in many ways that one might presume as 
for instance, photograph, camera, photographer, perhaps not even as image, or uh, some other handy conventional category. One effect of thinking about photography in scalar terms, given that it necessitates accommodating oneself to the constellation of different notions of sale in scale in any perspective on photography, is that these terms, these categories, now name moments of possibility, likely, but not necessary conjunctions, the fate of which is to coalesce and then to dissolve. So this may, in the end, be a naive observation, quite likely, but it does set the scene for bracketing such cate categories in this, in this context of uh, processes of individuation. There is no time here to attempt an exegesis of Simon Don's philosophical terminology in the hope of exploring this in great detail. And I, frankly, I'm not the person one should turn to for this anyway, being in no way an expert on his philosophy. But this is not the point of my paper, as I hope will be clear. Really, I want to move further in the direction suggested by my reading of Flusser towards Simondon's conception of the mode of being of technical objects, leaning on his notion of milieu in order to follow the thread of scale's importance for photography and to explore the necessity that I think uh, ha has to be attributed to the always compounded relations of scale we find in it. Simondon's uh, 1965 essay, Culture and Techniques, might provide a vehicle for exploring this. As Andrea Bardan and Giovanni Mengele, I'm sure it's not Mengele, Menegale, sorry for garbling that name, write in their in introduction to its English publication, this essay, quote, represents the consolidation of an intellectual project developed in Simonon's larger earlier works and a programmatic restatement of its underlying political motivation. The formulation of a social pedagogy of techniques aimed at the reintegration of technology into culture. And this, they, they go on to say, uh, is in a context where culture is viewed, I quote, as an ideological system of def defense against techniques, a symptom of the abstraction of human life from its material and technical environment. Now, significantly, in this essay, Simondon articulates this conflict between techniques and culture as an issue of scale. As he writes explicitly, and I quote, we might even say that the conflict between culture and techniques is above all a question of scale, end quote. Now, thinking of this in a photographic register, following on from the, this, this kind of the, 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 the problematization of the kind of locus points, the categories of individuality that, through which we might, we might think of photography, the first effect of all of this is to defamiliarize how we might think of photography, how we might, through what categories through which we might think about it. And this uh, can be read out of and, and, and further um, articulated in Simondon's comments about the car in this essay as a technical object. My suggestion is, perhaps probably quite crudely at first, to play through passages of this text, transliterating it brutally into questions of photography as a technical object, in order to experiment with what aspects, what narrative clusters of scales or scalar ideologies might find a register there. To me, the res resonances appear multiple and suggestive. As Simonon writes, the object of everyday use is a compromise, often a sort of monster that suffocates technical norms beneath a cultural overload that denatures them. The nearer the object is to the order of magnitude of man, the more it is tied to everyday life, the more impure and unsuitable for the instruction of technicity that object, that object is. Provisionally transliterated into a photographic context, one might um, begin to experiment with what this, what this means and take this kind of question of cultural overload as, as, as a critical figure of the conventions of making, seeing and using photographs. And that with a nod to Zachary's talk uh, on Thursday, and to take these as narrativized clusters or series of scales, photographer, camera, image, image, object, for instance, that vary according to particular contexts and orientations of use. Artistic, domestic, uh, industrial, or instrumental being one classic hierarchy. Such clusters of scales that do organize many prevalent attitudes towards photography, certainly privileged uh, a, a proximity to the magnitude of embodied human beings, and as such, their displacement by other technically derived norms in a defamiliarizing, in defamiliarizing specific modes of photography, promise quite, quite a lot of value to take the, uh, this kind of 
ideologically denatured uh, uh, um, con conventions of photography and, and overturn them. Now, I'm not suggesting that the reading this, um, such texts as, as in, in transliterating them into a photographic context would provide a kind of a new model of uh, ideology critique. That would be a kind of an otios and, and kind of quite banal um, suggestion. Really, the object is to try and trace through this the constellations, the conjunctions between is different issues of scale uh, in, the, in, uh, in the way that they meet or collide with one another in photographic objects or photographic forms as technical objects. This photography theory and criticism have long been engaged in teaching us that the photographic image exists in a condition of venality, overloaded with psychosocial overdeterminations, but it has not yet done so particularly in ways that attempt to come to terms with the scaled character of these facts. Um, in drawing to an end without really providing a conclusion, one might kind of uh, dwell on Simondon's concept here of a determinate reticulation, reticulation denoting a net-like pattern or structure, extending from the elements and operations of the technical objects involved. So in this essay, as, it, as elsewhere, Simondon takes the elements or the kind of component parts of technical objects to be more universal uh, than the than the kind of the object itself, the components of a camera being more universal than the camera as an object itself, precisely for the reasons uh, we've just dwelt on, as the elements or the components are more concretely inscribed in wider networks uh, and not so culturally overloaded. Um, and I'm suggesting then shifting this kind of reading of the technical object onto it, the 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 less onto this complex question of the, of the, of the constellation of scalar values, processes, uh, and, and, and forms that can coalesce around the cameras, around the phot photography as a technical object. And it's with this as a, as a kind of a, a promising conceptual starting point that I, that I would like to end on here in lieu of a proper con conclusion. So. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's great. Lots for us to be thinking about. Okay, so if you could unshare your screen. Ah, yes. Okay. And we'll give you a little break while we move on to Lawrence. Okay, so. Right. So, Lawrence Kent completed a PhD at King's College London on cinema and metaphysics in 2020, and he is currently a teaching associate at the uh, Centre for Film and Screen at the University of Cambridge. He has had articles published in Film Philosophy, uh, Ply, 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 the Warwick uh, Journal of Philosophy, Frame Cinema Journal and Cinema Journal of Philosophy and the Moving Image. Today, he is going to be giving us a paper entitled The Cosmic Non-Place, Intelligence and Scale in Frant Guo's The Wandering Earth. Great. Lawrence, thank over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to um, Oliver and Magdalena for organising this fantastic conference. Um, I think as Andrew, similar to Andrew, I'll be nodding to previous talks as well. It's been so strong and thought provoking. Um, I think it's necessary to do so. Let me share my screen now. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Yeah, that looks good to me. Good. Okay, just rearrange. So, uh, uni so yeah, I'll begin. Uh, so, universalism um, as the as the, the desire to totally escape bloated particularities is perhaps an impossible thought, at least a difficult task. It is an an endeavor that many science fiction films attempt with varying levels of success. Such groping for universal valuation is registered by expanding the scale of reference, but it is in these vast expanses of science fiction excess that the particular, the local and the parochial make their return. Thinking globally and geopolitically, I want to work through 
how the movement towards the universal and planetary thinking within cinema is constantly ruptured with reminders of place and geopolitical specificity that harbor insidious implications. Of course, this has always been a problem with gestures towards the universal, where the universalizing of a narrow set of normative assumptions around the European subject as generic rationality undermines any truly universal project. So then the question becomes, as Tiago de Luca recently asks, um, quote, can we disentangle these discourses from Eurocentric premises and presuppositions while retaining their collective thrust? In this paper, I will look outside of Europe to Frank Gros' adaption of The Wandering Earth from 2019, examining different visions of the universal that harbor scale and nesting of national particularities within visions of global maneuvers. The film offers a space to explore failures of planetary thinking alongside surprising moments that envision egress from moribund colonial logics. It can enable and problematize um, global valuations of reason and through an analysis of the film's situated realities alongside stated universal ambitions, uh, this paper will explore the contradictions and potentials for the representation of intelligence on the global scale. Uh, to investigate, and to quote De Luca again, how, quote, utopian energies can underpin conceptions of globality and sometimes uneasily coexist with expansionist ideologies. So from anthropocentric climate change to the current global pandemic, the necessity to think through the pitfalls and possibilities of human action on the world stage has never been more pressing. This requires reassessing the ability to think universally and properly defining the role of reason um, in theoretical and political analysis. So as the feminist collective Luborio Cubonic states, quote, global complexity opens us to urgent cognitive and ethical demands such that emancipatory politics, quote, hinges on a profound reworking of the universal. Since the rise of computer science and the engineering of machine life, this has become the question of intelligence. Philosopher Catherine Malibu opines that, quote, the return of intelligence is one of the most important theoretical issues of the 21st century, and cinema is reflecting these concerns. So my larger speculative project, of which this paper is a kind of a small sort of like early part in the kind of the work, a big kind of you know, work in progress, um, looks at how recent popular cinema um, can be put, um, this sort of global popular cinema can be put in conversation with contemporary philosophers such as Helen Hester, Reza Negrostani, Thomas Moynihan and Pete Wolfendale, amongst others, who reassess notions of intelligence and rationality in the face of contemporary global crisis. And, and it is collective intelligence under these threats, which is exactly at the center of Frant, Frant Gros' um, film. To introduce the film, um, it's a Chinese blockbuster uh, based on the novella by uh, acclaimed sci-fi author, Sitchin Liu. By presenting a scenario whereby our rocket propelled planet travels in search for a more hospitable solar system and imagines the global agency required to literally move the earth out of cosmic existential danger. And, impresses the, and, and, and embraces the possibility of collective intelligence and communal mastery of technology. However, the film's own geopolitical particularities also then seep into the fabric of its planetary visions through its centering of China on the world stage. One way this happens um, is through its presentation of space. And I want to think through that today um, using Mark Auger's concept of the non-place. Um, So the dream of escaping from localized space is definable as a form of supermodernity in Auger's terminology, um, an acceleration of history uh, co-committant with shifts in time and space, not to mention changes to ego formation in economies that emphasize the individual or the self as a specific locus of market forces. These non-places um, include things like airports, shopping malls, and train stations, to name a few of the, the ones that OJ um, focuses on. And you can see on uh, the front cover of one of the more recent pub, uh, editions of his book. Interestingly, OJ begins his investigation into the non-place, arguing for an ethnography of the near, an assessment of European spaces, and not the assumption that the, quote, interesting spaces open to such study only exist out there. <laughs> 
Implicit perhaps here is the Western European nature of the non-place as the attempted universalizing of rational function and way from the adherence to national or cultural specificity, indeed the universalization of empire through colonial logics. Auger importantly nuances this by the end of his book and recalling perhaps Hébert Césaire's notion of a failed European humanism is that without the quote measure of the world, um, Auger notes that empire despite claims to universalism and uh, modernity, was a, quote, botched modernity, and emphasizes the restrictions to space and information that occur under conditions of colonial power and control. The non-place today as a site of futuristic supermodernity is often displaced to the image of the Far East. For example, Tash O's 2013 novel, Five Star Billionaire, severs the historical lineage of China's socialist past and presents Shanghai and its role in the sectors of global finance, according to Jason Enghun Lee, such that it, quote, conflates the whole of Shanghai into a single zone of commercial and cultural transaction, recalling Mark Urge's distinction between place and non-place, representing, and here they are quoting Urge, a, quote, abstract unmediated commerce, a world thus surrendered to solitary individuality, to the fleeting, to the temporary, and the ephemeral. In a different register, Ao Hui Deng has recently argued that, quote, Singapore can be seen as one giant non-place. In recent science fiction cinema, we might think of Luke Besson's 2014 Lucy set in Taiwan. By first locating the film in Taipei, Besson is um, reaching for the universal image of the future, but is instead grasping what we can call a kind of techno-orientalism. Indeed, in the opening montage of the film, which you can see in front of you, um, hopefully moving, um, he presents a kind of technological futurity of Taipei. The scene is set in what the film seems to be positioning as the current most advanced future. And indeed, even this most advanced of technological spaces is what the titular character Lucy will overcome. She spends the entire film kind of becoming a superhuman being. So what Besson does here is to turn the whole of Taipei into a non-place whilst centralizing um, in the figure of Scarlett Johansson, um, whiteness. So this is the kind of techno-orientalism that Abby Lauren Kidd describes in the film that quote, works to conflate exceptionality as exclusive to whiteness while whilst appropriating Asian culture and marginalizing Asian people within their narr native landscapes. There is the representation here of the quote, Asian body as a form of expendable technology. As I pivot back to thinking about the Chinese sci-fi blockbuster, one, The Wandering Earth, it is worth pausing on this techno-orientalizing neo-colonial gesture of plastering an image of the future onto the Far East. It is an inverted orient orientalism that as Gabriella de Sita posits, does not solve the denial of covalness, co the West forces on the other, deemed to not cohabit the same temple zone as the, quote, civilized world, but forces the Far East into the future and thus denies the, quote, possibility of challenging and negotiating representation in the co present staked out by Western knowledge production. But a difficult line exists between this and forms of ethno-futurism that have proliferated after the development of Afrofuturism. Such a pairing of um, traditional ethnic or national sentiment to create a vision of the future from alternative materials to the hegemonic Western vision of the future um, is productive, but the question of where such images and theoretical incentives come from is very important. So one such um, ethno-futurism worth keeping in mind as we turn to the wandering earth is that of sino-futurism. The origins, the origins of the term do not necessarily hold promise for an organic vision of the future originating in Chinese thought. Virginia L. Conn states that, quote, as a mode of global and temporal situatedness, Sinofuturism has largely um, emerged as a concept applied extensively, um, e externally, sorry, to China by Western observers. The seeds of some of the earliest Sinofuturisms Sino were brewing in the philosophy department in Warwick in the 1990s. And the first explicit mention of Sinofuturism, I think, comes from Steve Goodman in the early 2000s. Because of this, uh, Virginia L. Kong goes on to write the quote, Sinofuturism differs from theorizations such as Afrofuturism, to which it is often compared, to its application to, not development from, the subjects it takes as objects. 
This means that for Carmen Herald, quote, while Afrofuturism was a crucial enabler for superseding racialized differences, Sinofuturism was intended to undergird its general sentiment of China being the future, thus reinforcing difference, end quote. Despite this, a developing, if still inconsistent, vision of Sinofuturism more organically positioned in regards to Chinese sources is perhaps finding its feet, shown in publications such as the SFRA review issue, um, Alternative Sinofuturism from 2020, and the issue of screen bodies also from that year on, quote, queer Sinofuturisms. Many of these uh, uh, positions and theoretical explorations find themselves responding to Malaysian Chinese artist Lawrence Lek's experimental work from 2016 titled, and you see uh, the sort of a, a screenshot from it on the screen, Sinofuturism 1839 to 2046 AD, which entailed taking techno-orientalist cliches and stereotypes and positioning them as positive features of a futuristic project. Importantly, further access in the West to futural thinking coming out of China is thanks to the international recognition of Sitchin Lu and his winning of the 2015 Hugo Award for his sci-fi book, The Three-Body Problem, sparking a rush of translations and adaptations of his work and indeed ushering in a new wave of internationally received Chinese sci-fi. One such adaptation is The Wandering Earth, the novella from 2000, which made, was made then into the film we're looking at today, um, in 2019 by Frank Guo. So the novella follows the realization that the dying of the sun will soon make the earth uninhabitable. And the only way to escape is to propel the planet and its inhabitants to a different star to find life. This interstellar emigration to Proxima Centauri, 4.3 light years away, will be a mammoth and complex operation lasting over 100 generations as the Earth wanders to its new home. The story takes place over a number of decades of a single protagonist's life, where they witness the destruction done to the surface of the Earth as new cities are positioned underground for protection, as well as societal strife in the differing interpretations of the solar science. The Earth's rotation is stopped with the help of propulsive devices on the surface of the Earth, which then swing our planet around the sun multiple times to pick up enough gravitational propulsion to then escape the solar system. So the envisioning of a planetary project capable of such a feat requires a level of collective action almost unthinkable. Humanity acts as a collective intelligence, the universal entity pushing forward a normative commitment to future generations beyond the political short-termism of the democratic or market-based solutions. In the story, it is also revealed that through genetic engineering, Individual intelligence has now been vastly updated, making the leaps in science and technology possible for this feat of moving the planet. Guo's film reworks the story substantially, focusing on a much shorter timeline, around 24 hours, and beginning in the middle of the journey set out by Liu. After some exposition provided through narration and news reports of climate change-like situations across the globe, we meet the Earth already wandering. But a gravitational spike and passing Jupiter means our planet will be engulfed by this massive neighbor. The film is also um, now centralized on a few hard headed characters and their will to see the mission through, saving the Earth from disaster, fitting into then the generic requirements of this action sci fi with a strong debt to a history of sort of Hollywood um, science fiction cinema. As Ping Zhu writes, the quote, Adaptation thus basically turns a profound sci-fi story into a family melodrama that seeks to cement the authority of the father, end quote. So we follow our protagonists and their adversarial relationship with their father, who works on the space station leading Earth on its journey. At the end, and spoilers, the film, um, at the end of the film, the father sacrifices themselves to the planet itself and saves the Wandering Earth project. So this has important ramifications for the thinking through of the proposed universalism of such, um, planet, such planetary project between film and novella. Instead of Liu's vision of world government, there's a clear implication that it is China that saves the planet, fitting well into narratives around China's green alternative to the polluting countries of the West, as the film itself dabbles with the allegorical links to questions of climate change. We thus see a kind of universalism of Chinese characteristics, which perhaps speaks to Yuk Hui's critique of Sinofuturism. The, fo Sino the forms of Sinofuturism that he finds on offer, he denigrates as, quote, only an acceleration of the European modern project, 
For example, um, China takes successful online platforms coming from America, censors them and creates their own versions. For example, they give. Um, and we can say of this film, um, the film itself was reviewed in the West as a bad copy of Hollywood apocalypse cinema with the kind of difficult um, question of sort of um, um, patronizing gestures of, of, of Western um, critics onto this film as well. But it's, it's, it's a question that, 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 that has been explored in those kind of um, reviews. So is The Wandering Earth prevent, presenting an alternative universalism or one built on the same model of a kind of European universalism, bringing its baggage of narrow definitions of the human, with territorializations to parochial concerns around family and nation, um, patriarchal power. The scale of the planetary is merely then an overblown portrayal of a much smaller scale of nationalistic ideology. It is the role of the family and its relationship to cultural imaginaries of the state that reroute a universal narrative into a specifically Chinese allegory for nationalist feeling, where perhaps the wandering earth itself is merely, merely the wandering of youth that needs to be tamed by the father figure and the state. As Chris Berry expands, the quote, father-son narrative is central to the wandering earth. Mao used to criticize Confucian values as feudal, but today Xi Jinping has reclaimed Confucianism as national heritage. In a Confucian society, the hierarchical patriarchal family is the model for relationships with the emperor as the father of the subjects and the party state as the father of all citizens. Children should be filial and obey their fathers and all subjects should be loyal and obey the emperor or party state. In turn, the father owes a duty of care to his children, end quote. The tension between the father's duty to his son, he promised to return uh, to earth to see him. Um, indeed, the day that the film takes place is, is, is Chinese New Year and his work um, on saving the planet, that these two things are intention throughout the film and emphasized, but then find themselves reconciled in the sort of final patriarchal sacrifice. The spaces of apocalyptic wonder rendered in an impressive CGI are interrupted with the psychic space of nationalist sentiment and the reaffirmation of the family state as primary. As Ping Wu writes, quote, nationalist sentiments had to be grafted to a post-nationalist setting of the sci-fi story. As Leo Sixin's original story unfolds in a post-solar era where there is only one government, the United Earth Government for all human beings. The film keeps the setting but persistently leaves the Chinese national branding, um, nationalist branding of its characters and plots, creating a special form of nationalism that is not bound to physical space, but rather to the psychic space of the characters, end quote. So the scale of national self-interest that the film pursues, in a sense, um, is attempted to fit with the scale of planetary travel through the film's own implicit expansionist ideologies. So this is not the cosmopolitan government depicted in Liu, um, Liu's original story, but a specifically Chinese version of this cosmopolitanism. But I want to argue and to try and think through how these scales are not totally resolved within the film. So one such um, kind of formal moment that I want to take is almost like indicative of, of some interesting um, scalar uh, confusions that happen in this film is the sort of hopefully what you can see is moving on the screen this sort of like small moment um, um, of mapping that happens in the film. So this this scalar confusion I think hints towards the impossibility of a resolution of scales and comes with the depiction of the protagonist journey across the ice the sort of ice landscape of the new planets um, or the earth's planets uh, new geographies. We see their vehicles navigating across the miles of this landscape when a shift in scale is registered with the graphic mapping of place onto the scene. So if the film attempts to enact what, in a second nod to Zachary Horton's uh, uh, keynote the other day, what Zachary Horton described as the, uh, quote, resolving cut between scales um, in its meeting of a familial psychic space onto then a planetary scale, this is, I think, a sort of metonymic moment of scalar incompatibility. As we um, briefly discussed off, after Horton's keynote, we can think of the cut as perhaps particularly cinematic and images of global movement placed in montage with the nationalistic affective movements of melodrama are resolved literally through the cinematic cut, seeing one thing then the other, um, grafted onto these sort of different scales as science fiction is wanted to do sort of every every big um, science fiction event of planetary scale becomes a movement between people from Lars von Trier's melancholia to 
um, you know, apocalyptic scenarios that are just about stopping uh, Bruce Willis or making Bruce Willis your father-in-law or something like that. Um, but in this moment, um, this allows no cut. Um, the images are superimposed on top of each other. Um, the lines themselves that we see in this mapping um, do not form an image familiar to us through the mapping processes of say something like Google Earth or Google Maps and do not provide us with a straightforward view from above. So for Marianne Doan, um, this view, the sort of view from above is defined by the erasure of the horizon. And she writes on the perceptual, perceptual strategies of this kind of mapping, um, quote, in our contemporary era of digital militarized and surveillance vision, disorientation is constitutive, structuring, even though it is not embraced by experience. Disorientation is not so much a menace to be repressed or foreclosed as it is an instrument to be deployed in the service of a pursuit of precise localization and its possession of a space understood as global. But the mapping we see on the screen is not, it does not disorient in the same way, avoiding this kind of erasure of the horizon. The spectator is not simply delocalized into an abstract and globalizing view, but such the gesture to the homogenization of space is then interrupted with the, the local, the sort of specific um, CGI sci-fi of this apocalyptic landscape and the sort of journey happening. So the space is not possessable, but wrenched back to the specificities of the on-screen action of individuals and familial strife. So I want to take this as a kind of formal intuition in the film of an irresolvability of scalar difference. While on the one hand, we have this return of the localizing within moments of global mapping and a sense of planetary action, we can turn this around and think of a kind of excessiveness of formal techniques in the film. The mesh of incompatible scales can reroute moments of planetary consciousness into local and narr national narratives, but there are also gestures to the global that exceed these retotorializing moments. It is the imagery of the planet itself um, that provides this formal overf overflow in the film as I kind of go on to the last section of the talk. So despite the domestication of the film's scope in comparison to the book and the fairly complex interweaving plots centering out lots of es episodic escapades from imprisonment to stealing a vehicle to a sent up an abandoned elevator shaft, um, the sort of like confusing, quite confusing plot of this film it's the sheer sight of the Earth's egress from its Copernican purse that repeats through the film that can be seen as excessive. So I want to think about the, the place of the Earth in the solar system and what kind of place or even non-place perhaps the planet itself becomes as we transport out of the solar economy. The excessiveness of these images of the Earth, um, the strange temporality when they are presented on screen both pertains to the frag fragility and perilousness of any um, human project when understood in its cosmic scopes, as well as how the image of Earth, despite the return of national sentiment within the film, forces an appreciation of a kind of planetary human endeavor. Importantly, instead of following the lines of sort of space colonization or jumping ship, where single countries or indeed individuals spread human um, values off world, the wandering Earth takes our home, our home with us while still fundamentally ungrounding the planet from its stable orbit. As Weo He translates, the director Frank Guo stated that, quote, the love of the earth is the unique core element in the spiritual world of the Chinese people. And it's for that reason the characters chose to wander with the earth rather than leave it behind. Um, perhaps we can talk in the discussion about this. That's not the justification for why the earth is wandering in the book, but um, the director seeing it as a kind of like moment of national um, pride is, is exactly this kind of interesting difference of um, um, motive scale and, and politics, perhaps. Where he then elaborates on this, emphasizing a specifically Chinese cosmopolitan vision of the universal that, quote, in the wandering earth, home represents compassion, love and care, all of which are universal human values. Instead of being driven by concerns for international trade, political alliances or cultural exchanges, the cosmopolitan community in the film gains its momentum from its constituents' common attachment to their home. What Sixteen Liu emphasizes in the book through scientific realism, um, the film through representational powers of CGI, shows us with the scale and effort of a wandering earth and turns it, turns it then into this different kind of symbol. Whereas this valorization of home balances between a hopeful universalism and the reification of the Chinese state family and its national sentiment, 
The cosmic precarity in these images figures a special kind of sort of responsibility on a spectator. So as our keynote tonight, Thomas Moynihan writes, existential hope and existential catastrophe are two sides of the same coin. There is no promise without peril, no responsibility without risk. And I think that kind of plays out in the image. Um, we see the sort of quite frightening image we see in front of us. And this dialectic of risk and reward is indeed played out in the fascinating, in fascinating ways uh, by the film's complex plot, which involves a mobilization of the world's resources, hyperbolically relayed through a single girl's emotional plea to the international community to come together with optimism for an almost futile last ditch attempt to save the earth, which indeed fails before Patriarch's final sacrifice saves the day. It is a series of ups and downs as characters uh, human characters pursue plans that the AI called Moss in charge of the wandering project has already calculated as impossible. But this image of the earth wandering out of place and into space inaugurates what could be called a kind of counter universal metaphor for colonized people, according to Amir Khan, who also suggests that the father's sacrifice, whereby he disobeys the AI and Moss, can be read as a revolt against, against Western forms of inhuman calculation. He writes that, quote, the film subtly suggests that Western voices are largely to be silenced or ignored. The planet must find ways and means to divorce itself, not from the watchful eye of cute Western technology per se, but from the logics which either breed it or are bred by it in order to navigate the planet to newer and better hopes. While this leads to difficult geopolitical questions regarding the place of China, both rapidly increasing technology um, for space exploration and their purported role in battling climate change, this metaphor of the wandering earth as a decolonial gesture itself has perhaps a kind of theoretical promise here. I want to, at the end, kind of just point toward, gesture towards a, a, an idea of, of, of how it is perhaps through a kind of rescaling of Marco Jay's notion of the non-place that we can radicalize and rethink it within planetary scales. Just as OJ claims that the empire is the opposite of the non-place and botched modernity of control and power struggle, what if the planet itself becomes a non-place in its cosmic immigration? OJ claims that the non-place is either an abundance of individualism or it's emptying out. And this seems to speak in interesting ways to the sake that I've tried to claim exists within the wandering earth. Whereas the novella initiates a voiding of the individual subject in the name of the collective project of planetary survival, the film hovers at the edge of filling the space with family and state melodrama while also spatially orienting us in the vast realms of an inhospitable universe. In Kahn's um, decolonial metaphor of the earth, they posit following the famous dictum that it's easier to imagine the end of world, the end, the end of the world than the end of capitalism, that quote, the effort required to decolonize minds, uh, human minds is as gargantuan as, the as that necessary to drive the planet to inhabit another solar system. Indeed, the ability to imagine technological progress beyond the pro profit motive necessary for this is almost unthinkable, as well as the kind of ego death of, this plan of the planetary citizen necessary for a project stemming 100 generations um, that seems as far-fetched as the world governments actually all coming together for a kind of global endeavor. But perhaps the non-place as a concept can help us at least sort of start to think through and register that's dramatized this future or thinking today. So in their recent um, article on Singaporean cinema that I alluded to earlier, Mao Hui Deng posits the whole of cinema as a non-place, but precisely to reclaim Auger's concept, displacing supermodernity onto different spaces in order to analyze the existence of, quote, real people living in these spaces. In their attempt to, quote, forge a sense of identification with the non-spaces, non-places. To view the wandering earth as becoming its own kind of non-place in its journey across the universe, perhaps illuminates the stakes of the ego in the situation of existential risk, where individually, individuality must be sacrificed, as it is indeed problematically in, in some interesting ways in Sitchin Lu's original novella, in order to bring together the project of humanity and rise to this cosmic challenge. The image of the earth wandering is a gargantuan one indeed, mirrored perhaps in the gargantuan task of its CGI replication. Interestingly here, a site of geopolitical contestation around the motives for this state sanctioned film, whether itself merely motivated by profit or kind of interesting meta textual bid in rivaling Hollywood blockbusters or an excessive image of cosmic precarity aimed at developing alternative sino futurisms um, and visions of the universal outside of the colonial gaze. So just to sort of finish up 
the earth as a non-place is, is indeed perhaps um, sort of interestingly and sort of enigmatically gestured towards at the end of OJ's book in a kind of negative form. So OJ writes that, quote, uh, one day perhaps there will be a sign of intelligent life on another world. Then through an effect of solidarity, whose mechanisms the ethologists have studied on a small scale, the whole terrestrial space will become a single place. Being from earth will signify something. In the meantime, though, it is far from certain that threats to the environment are sufficient to produce the same effect. The community of human destinies is experienced in the anonym anonymity of the non-place and in solitude. The wandering earth is a figure of, solitary, of a solitary journey where the preciousness of life, its precarity, is marked through images of the planet's exit from the solar system. Does the earth become a place? a home filled perhaps with the baggage of tradition and its messy scalar politics of nationhood? Or could we instead think productively about the cosmic non-place of the planet in its transit out of moribund logics of the national and the colonial? Either way, the Earth as a whole becomes an image with Rose film thus then contributing to the image of a kind of planetary consciousness. But yeah, just to finally conclude, final paragraph. The Wandering Earth provides a messy, uh, provides messy and contradictory spaces for the negotiation of concepts surrounding universal rationality, intelligence, and the possibility for collective planetary agency. There are also sites where geopolitical forces around future all thinking find voice, including the soft power of the Chinese state pushing familial dramas with cosmic scopes. However, perhaps um, it also offers subtle exit routes where the spatial fragility of humanity in the wandering earth lends the realization of cosmic existential risk to understandings and responsibilities of our shared universal project of survival. And the role of cinema, I claim, um, and will claim in this sort of hopefully to be done one, one day, uh, a larger project, uh, the role of cinema is vital here. as a popular art form involved in mediating ideological and geopolitical strife, but also as a medium which can envisage and temporalize impossible spaces through its seemingly endless digital capacities. Such a reflection on our own capacities to think universally and rationally is vital from opening up future intelligence and realizing current responsibilities to unknow unknowable futures. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Lawrence. That's a wonderfully rich analysis. Um, yeah, I've got, I've got loads of questions, but we'll, we'll come to that later. OK, so now we will turn to our final speaker. Uh, provides, mm, I'll just put you. Yeah. There we go. So, so provides Ung was trained as an architect and a researcher. Her work looks at the emergence of digital tools, their impacts and applications within the urban context. She is a lecturer at the Bartlett School uh, of Architecture uh, at UCL um, and the managing editor of the Bartlett Perspective Journal. She's currently pursuing a PhD at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, um, entitled "Collaborative," uh, sorry, on collaborative intelligence, uh, which received the best presentation award at SIGRADI in 2021. During the pandemic, she co-organized the virtual reality roundtable series "Decentralized Education uh, and Fidgetal Exchange," uh, with support from UCL's Researcher Initiative Award. She co-founded two design R&D labs, uh, Rational Energy Architects, which focuses on artificial intelligence applications in bio-inspired solar design, and Current, which experiments on volumetric cinemas with multimedia and computer graphics tools. And you just organized an event about that, if I'm correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, so both practices are active in sharing knowledge, hosting international workshop series, um, and uh, at various conferences and other educational platforms. And they've also been exhibited world, uh, worldwide. Uh, provides, uh, was also an alumnus of the Strelka Institute uh, run by Benjamin Bratton, uh, one of our um, uh, keynotes from yesterday, um, and at the Stadelschule Architecture School in Frankfurt. Today, um, she's presenting a talk entitled Universal Basic Service, Scalability of CF CFHT and DAO. Over to you, Provides. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I guess um, I should make it clear that I'm actually the maternity cover for the Perspective Journal. And actually, I've also changed a little bit of the title so I can have a more uh, rigid theoretical framework. Okay, it's showing the right no screen, problem. right? Okay. Yes, I can see that. Thank you. 
time provides. Um, I'm really glad to be at this conference. So thank you, Oliver and Madalena for organizing it. It's also quite a privilege to be in the same panel as Andrew and Lawrence. Uh, they're talking about aesthetics and the speculative tools to provide critical review of reality through photography and cinematology. So I'm a bit on the other end of the spectrum of universalism and hopefully can contribute to the richness of the picture. So I'll be sharing some preliminary thoughts on universal basic service. This study is more like a self-searching exercise to see if the notion is indeed a universal invariant, especially as you know, I'm someone who was born into British colonial Hong Kong. It's a bit of a funny context of otherness. So I really wanted to know if there can be definitions that exist outside of Western epistemy and that what we mean by basic should be contextualized to specific cultural and natural geographies. So I was trained as an architect and the motivation behind the study is really to look at the collectivization and decollectivization process on land and housing. And scalability specifically is the threshold to which these processes uh, might disintegrate. Okay, so UBS is a form of social security in which all citizens of a community, region or country receive unconditional access to a range of free basic public service funded by tax and provided by the government. It's the idea of a welfare state and the term appeared in 2017 with the first modeling report from UCL that was uh, quite welcomed by the British Labour uh, Library, Labour Party, sorry. And that's kind of what it looks like. We have healthcare, education, democracy, shelter, food transport, and information. So as a Chinese, this inspired me and provoked me to think about my own cultural context. And that if UBS means or waits the same to everyone across territories and at all times, and this is actually a very popular proverb, uh, it means clothing, food, housing, and transportation, what the CFHT was about. It's so basic that we probably don't even think twice when referring to it. And it seems to be describing the basic material need to necessitate and sustain everyday life. But is it really that tangible? You know, in philosophy or in um, Western philosophy, the more fundamental an idea, the more depth or diversity you can probably get out of its connotation. That's why I started asking myself, why do they put clothing first? It doesn't make sense, right? So I had to go back to history, actually more than 2000 years of history. I know it's a cliche that uh, Chinese has a long history, but yeah. I went back to the ancient texts and um, it was very difficult to understand, I tried my best. So clothing in ancient Confucian thinking has a connotation in rights and social structure. So rights might be quite performative today and has everything to do with religion. But actually at the time, the performative quali uh, quality is actually what constitute collectivity through everyday practice. So a synchronized moral standard from material to intangible, there's not enough time to go into, but I just show one example, which is called guanzi puyo. It's like a gentleman pairing with one's jade. So basically when you wear the jade, when you walk, you have to master in the rhythm in order to make the jade sound right. So in this, it sort of symbolized that the everyday practice of a gentleman with virtue is one who always makes sure that they're uh, doing the right thing and is righteous. So it's recorded in a book of rights about social and personal beliefiness, righteousness and morality. Now, of course, many would say that, you know, ancient thinking doesn't really suit contemporary concerns. If people are dying from lack of food, who cares about walking properly, right? And this is why some modern theorists would go from CFHT to FCHT, meaning food first and everything else. And for instance, in Chinese medicine, it is a practice of the everyday and it's modernized through the science of the body within a cosmological environment. So we have the lunar terms and the solar terms, and this chart is what we should be doing during the spring terms. For instance, we will just talk about food. It says here that we should be eating something that warms and nurtures the stomach and spleen, and then we should be eating something only seasonal. So basic service is suddenly not just about spatial, but also the time domain. And a body of knowledge is not so basic because I don't even recognize half the vegetable shown here as uh, just asparagus, I recognize asparagus. So the knowledge body, I suddenly realized that inherit from supposedly my culture, which, was, which has survived as one of the uh, largest and oldest agricultural civilization. It teaches us to respect the cycle of cosmos because if you farm, obviously you need to respect cosmos. 
And also one last example is that in Chinese medicine, when they prescribe you medication, it's dependent on where you're from, whether you're from the North or the West or the East. Uh, yeah, and whether you're close to the sea or you're continental and also what season it is, as opposed to, you know, Panadol, universal prescription and Western med uh, medication. So it's pretty fascinating for me to reflect on this. Um, in Chinese cosmology, we're basically entering to the territory of Tai Chi. So the modeling of system states through yin yang. I mean, I don't have time to go all the way into it, but I just put a bit of a keywords that may help us to grasp the connotation that these are actually not dichotomies, it's always dynamic. So this is kind of like a 4D projection on 2D plane that I found. And this diagram can be read as many things. One way is to look at the development cycle in civilization. So yin is the developed and yang is the developing. The yin is the ordered, like the water mo molecules in cold condition, it's solid. And yang is always expanding and growing and it's energy. It's like boiled water. Um, and such knowledge in Western epistemy is entropy, right? So universal basic service is not only to geographies and seasonal domain, it's also development cycle of the context, expanding or steadying. And the services should be varying according to cosmos states. So not just human centric. So something as simple as providing asparagus to people in spring to the complex system of distributing such resources. This is where we're gonna get it. So land is seen as the mother who provide and land is the yin in yin yang, which can be traced back to the book of I Ching, also uh, partially inspired uh, Leibniz in the binary system. So Kun Wei Di Wei Mu means that yin is the earth, yin, yin is the mother. And thus land becomes the core to the problem we have here, as all of clothing, food, blah, blah, housing is provided by the mother, the land. And the problem of UBS becomes distribution and, ma and management of this finite heterogeneous resources. So this is the plan for the rest of the 20 or so minutes. Uh, from scales of internation, intranation, intercity, intracity to the individual, I intend to map a timeline of events around the Chinese communist and nationalist history and bring that to the contemporary urban context of Hong Kong and Singapore, ending with a very preliminary investigation in peer-to-peer -peer digital economies like that of blockchain. So 1924 is where we will start. Dr. Sun Yat Sen integrated the cultural ontology of CFHT into his theory of people's livelihood. It is the foundation to the new socialism thinking during China's liberation from feudalism in the late 19th century. And it's basically, it's to apply Chinese thinking together with Western utilization. So Sun's theory had the aim to resolve the entanglement between land and capital at the time. So it tries to har harmonize land ownership, and state-owned land is the main objective in the proposal to enhance the social economic structure and to have a price discovery system for all of the land. So the original land value belongs to its owner, but the rise in land price should be a public asset. So in a socialist spirit, if everyone can do their respective duties, then everyone will naturally get the four CFHT needs. This implies that CFHT is not only a universal basic need, but also a universal responsibility. So how can this communal and collectivization process look like in action? Now, this is what uh, Soon's sort of hand-painted manuscript was with people's livelihood on the uh, outer skirt, and then there's socialism, communism, and collectivism within. So this is a game called Dao Di Zhu. I'm not sure if we have Chinese here, but this is like a really popular game. Whenever you're bored, you just play it. You only need three people. It's basically called Defeat the Landlord. So when I was in anthropology class with Professor Andrew Kipnis um, in CHK, I was reminded of this game because we were talking about this land history. It's very popular. It's very easy to learn, but it's very hard to master like any other card game. And it requires a lot of mathematical and strategic thinking. Now we have an AI to actually calculate this. But what's special about this is that there is a role playing. So we have three players. Uh, one player is the landlord and two players are the peasants. The peasants has to collaborate to win the landlord without knowing the card of each other's. And the landlord has a bit more card. 
So, you know, it's really representing the class struggle during the land reform era since the 1949. And it's kind of like assimilating the communist history of land distribution. So back to the point about agricultural civilization, the importance of land uh, cannot be understated. The reform can be said to have three major periods of collectivization, decollectivization, where the party instituted land reform and people who had lots of land and are rich are labeled as landlords, which are rich farmers, but people who are poor are peasants. And in a feudal system, farmers and peasants are different because farmer has a lot of money, peasants are poor who is farming to survive. And then they have to pay back every year with crops. So the reform of land take away what was the landlords and redistribute in every single village in China in an even manner. But what does even mean? So what I intend to do is to inspire by the game to have a thought experiment and we simulate three situations of collectivization and decollectivization to understand what is the challenge of even. So simulation one is decollectivization where let's say land is equally distributed within villages and we have let's say X amount of village in China, each village gets an equal share of land and then it goes to household scale let's say five people in each household and each household gets five shares of land for farming. So is this considered equal? Well, in reality, no, but why not? Because you know, some villages started with a lot of land, some villages started with arable land, other villages started with land that are not arable, uh, maybe some with lots of land, very few people per capita. So each person gets more land. And this is kind of like in the early 50s, this becomes a big problem during uh, the decollectivization. So what about collectivization, where land become a larger grouping and the village as a whole become a collective. So we're at the village scale becomes a government and the entire village owned all of land and it's no longer distributed to household, but that it control all of that land together. So what did they do? You know, people live in village become more like factory workers because each village distribute work and pay off amongst themselves. And then they tell each other what to do. You know, he go pick all the wheat, she'll go feed all the pigs. And instead of a day-to-day -day laboring decided by individual households, it's a collective government to collect harvests and redistribute, blah, blah, blah. And you also have begin to have like a work point system to record the agricultural work that you did. Um, and one thing is that it's easy to collect tax in such a system because you can't cheat. So collectivized agricultural structure is similar to, you know, what had happened in 50s and 60s. Now we're back to the game where we drew a condition card and we have a natural hazard problems and also governance condition because of the scale of governance. And there was a great famine. Maybe half the people died. So now what you have to do? In economic theory, you have to decollectivize again because this sort of decollectivization may help to stimulate productivity. So let's say your village has X amount of land, your household has five people, you have shot, uh, five shares of the village land. And every year you'll go back to the central taxation bureau. But now we have another problem because household is actually not a constant concept. We have people who get born, people who die, people who get married and move somewhere, people who go to the city. So the household size change all the time. And how do we keep land even? So what we do is that we will hold back certain portions of land and then we can give out in future years. And also in farming, you can rotate it so that you don't over extract from land nutrition. And then we would run that land collectively out before they give that back every year, maybe at spring festival where we usually have this big meetings to redistribute, figure out the population change and relocate resources according to the scale of the household. So the problem, another problem of course, people know that their land might be lost in one year. So they will not take uh, good care of them. So what about relocate every five year, 10 year, 20 year, maybe people take more uh, care of the land and the, there's some consistency and variability over time. So the problem is how to allocate resources within village, which is not so simply defined. And this is like a really simple thought experiment, right? And we're kind of at the 70s, where we start having this uh, understanding of the small common and the big common, and then we're distributing inter and intra commons. So we're kind of at the end of the game. I also want to show what was happening in Taiwan simultaneously, 
um, the land reform policy promoted by the government in the early post-war period is served like a continuation of the nationalist communist war in China. So in mainland, the land reform won a major support from peasants. So after the nationalist government got defeated and retreated to Taiwan in 1949, they want to establish a financial foundation to ensure that enough food and resources and basic services are there to support the huge army and in order to strengthen the rule because they just fled there. It was necessary to implement land reform again to eliminate the power of the landlords and also to gain support of local communities. So the United States was in the picture as well, and they were uh, actively assisting the nationalist government in Taiwan to promote this land reform. And then they came up with three major policies, 375 rent reduction, which is to stipulate the rent rate paid by the tenant farmers to the landlord with a maximum of 37.5%. The common land release, which is uh, the release uh, publicly leased arable land to be purchased by existing tenant farmers so they can own it as opposed to renting it. And last is land to the tiller. So the government expropriate private land and rent that to farmers who can't afford to buy it. So here the UBS is anchored on relieving the burden of peasants ensuring rights of the landlord while moving landlord capital towards industrialization. So from land reform, we go to property redistribution in such a context. So, you know, when we were talking through the game, we scaled across village and then it's interregional. It's, if we parallel that to urban development, the value of farming is declining. So if you farm a land, each person get, I don't know, like uh, 10,000 yuan a year. So if you farm a land for a household, it's sort of like a same income as a factory worker. But factory wages are going up and the value of farming is going down. So if you are the individual and you compare relative amount of money, not many people really want to farm anymore. It's like a really hard work. Um, so we have the emergence of the consolidators. Consolidators are the people who say, I'll stay behind and farm. I'll farm not just my household, I'll scale it up. I'll rent 20 household worth of land. I'll give you some money and you can work in a city and not worry about the land. So effectively you have fewer people farming then you need more land mechanization. On the other hand, you have um, large corporations, huge businesses coming in. So the problem becomes who farms? Is it the local consolidators or the large corporates? And you know, if food security is a universal basic service and we have 1.4 billion mouths to feed, and we also have to export worldwide, everywhere around the world, should privatization be dealt with? You know, so you have livability and community, who gets left behind in villages? What do you do with old people? Is it more men than women? So we have also declining birth rate and increasing aging. So once we scale up the sort of system, we realize how much problem is in the picture. And when we get at the late 90s and 2000s, Farming is becoming a lot easier, right? We have chemical fertilizer, genetic modification, automation. This is more like turning into the intensive farming, uh, like what we have in the States. We have higher level of input and output per unit of arable, arable land. It's easier to govern if we centralize because it will give higher yields and it's easy to collect tax. So is it the end of small scale farming? Within a Chinese context, it's a bit more difficult to do this because agricultural civilization. We have a lot of population in villages and you can't just push everyone out even though most of them wants to go to the city. So 2001, 180 pages of tentative study on China's rural marketization. Three fundamental was at, uh, questions was asked in that report. Where will good be sold? Where will money come from? And where will the laborers go? So in Chinese, we call that san long wen ti. It's actually the PhD thesis of Chairman C. So today you see Taobao Village, which is the high technology platform economy, but actually the history of market, uh, rural marketization, it's not so hype. It's a problem that's been dealt with uh, in the past uh, 70, 80 years in China, where government is cascaded from local household to village government to higher level government, and also to look at it as one system. So 70 years after, this is where we started, poor farmers, 99% who can't read. And now this is where we at. So it's like 
I like to show this picture because it's two groups of very determined Chinese ready to make a leap of faith. And the first fo photo captured the moment during the land reform. And the second photo captured the moment during the biggest annual e-commerce shopping festival. And last year, they generated 84 billion gross merchandise volume. That's not money, it's volume during two weeks span. So yes, it's a lot. Um, so now we are moving into the contemporary context in the second half of the presentation from rural to urban context. This is where I was born into, where I grew up. Um, it's today's challenge housing crisis, especially in the collectivization, decollectivization of resources uh, to the economic perspective, it's not so much about farmlands, right? It's about housing as a derivative of land and a universal basic service. So Hong Kong exemplify the aspect of scaling and this scale is geographically small, but proportionally it's huge because it's one of the highest density cities in the world. And any sort of domestic project is uh, very large scale. So the density blurs the boundary between small common and big common, and the distribution of resources is not just horizontally, but also vertically, going from 2D to 3D. So the figure I'm showing here basically show housing price in the past 40 years from the 80s, before Hong Kong was returned to the Brit uh, return from British colonial rule. We sort of experienced three periods of collectivization and decollectivization due to several crises, and I've highlighted them in red. 2019 is not really in red, uh, the pandemic, and I'll explain why later. We had two main waves of surge. Each surge is 400%. One surge was before the handover, the other is after the handover and it's still going on. And in the middle, we have two global scale financial crises and one epidemic, and now we're on the second pandemic. And one thing I'd like to point your attention to is 1997, right? It's the handover year. And as you can see, before that year, we already have a slight housing crisis. But because of the crisis, the price went down. So everybody thought the housing crisis was gone and it gave the illusion that you know, the problem is relieved. So what caused this? What happened before the handover? Well, we had the joint declaration between UK and China where in Annex 3, they specify the maximum of 50 hectares of new land can be granted per year. And this excludes uh, public housing. So this is to protect both parties to ensure that the land value stays locally within Hong Kong. So 50 hectare was the outcome of much evaluation that referenced land sale size in adjacent years, together with the annual expense of the British Hong Kong government at the time. So nonetheless, the release of the news itself actually caused developer to stock up on land because they're scared that they're gonna be capped and has a lateral effect on Hong Kong's due. This is our first chief executive, uh, Dong Gimwa. He came on and he was very determined to provide housing for all. And he came up with the 85,000 policy. So this is what I call the first period of collectivization. It's not a governance collectivization per se, but it's an economic collectivization. So 85,000 policy is to build 85,000 units of housing every year in a hope that within 10 years, 70% of families can have permanent homes. We have a lot of people here. So it also has to increase transport infrastructure and urban density. Unfortunately, we also had the 1997 Asian financial crisis same year. So that five year was disastrous. I think I was 10 years old. Uh, the middle class suffered heavily from negative equity. They were actually protesting that the housing price is too low. And it's saying here that if everyone gets a flat, then no one will have food. So suddenly you have the situation where food and housing become a zero sum game. And I remember I saw this on the news, people would hate uh, Dong Ginwa so much because, you know, negative equity. But now when we look back, we know he was doing the right thing, but not at the right time. So 85,000 policy has been dropped to stabilize the market. So this is a period in the middle from uh, 2002 to 2012. We also had to stop the subsidized housing scheme. So the property ladder, which is kind of like the social ladder was kind of broken because we stopped the middle part. And after that, we went through a decade of decollectivization. Actually, not so much that, but more like privatization to help heal the market. And indeed, it healed itself. After 2012, we got back to where it was uh, before 1997. This is also the moment when we realized that actually the housing crisis did not go away. It was an illusion. 
So now it went back to where we started, but no one dares to propose another collectivization scheme. Instead, the past 10 years has been more focused on financial policy in home ownership in order to help uh, first time owners to get a home. And we have the carry land plan, which ensures that first time buyer can mortgage up to 90% from banking institute and the hot chili policy, which is extra double taxation on housing investment to prevent speculation. So the price has seen some stability in the past two to five years with 27 overall increase, 27% uh, ranking between Seoul and Copenhagen. So even though this might help to solve affordability issues in housing, it cannot help to tackle livability, especially when you have to scale to really high density estate. This is where I wanted to explore peer-to-peer -peer digital economy, whether it's going to help with the situation or actually a fantasy of the technology. So decentralized autonomous organization. It utilizes blockchain technology for crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. It's kind of like a novel tool to execute crowd govern, uh, governance at scale. Uh, they did crowdsource like billions of dollars. So that's some sort of scale. And the problem that interests me is whether DAO is collectivization or decollectivization, because when I really think about it, it's not so simply defined. So blockchain is a distributed ledger technology. It utilizes cryptography and consensus mechanism like proof of work to conceive a trustless economy, which is peer to peer. And based on the 2008 Bitcoin white paper, it was said to be an e-cash system. It's collectivizing informal economy that creates economic value and blockchain becomes the tool to execute a sort of pseudo governance. But where did blockchain came from? Well, this brings us back to the 2008 global financial crisis followed by the 2000s dot-com bubble. There was an overall loss in trust uh, in governance, especially after the Lehman brother went bankrupt. So people started thinking if the state federal reserve system is essentially a decentralized central bank that has 12 privately chartered financial institutes, why can we print our own money and govern ourselves? So at the same time, it's execution. It's a form of decollectivization or more accurately, it's frictionalization because universal basic service here provided is to withdraw or split. For instance, in the white paper, they specify that if any individual is unhappy with the collective decision of the majority, this individual can at any point split into its own community. So sort of fractionalization becomes a social security and it's sort of a safety mechanism of scaling up distributed system. I was actually discussing this with uh, Professor Tat Lam the other day, and he asked me this question. Um, is the novelty of blockchain a sort of structuralism or is it evolutionary within de uh, the development of our economic history? So this is sort of the last part where I wished us uh, to reflect a bit on this. Structuralism thinking. History of economy from the anthropological understanding is that the function of money or credit is actually just a ledger since day one. In the tribal era, we used to tie knots as a form of accounting, and maybe the leader will keep the accounting profile under a rock or something. So it's only how we're tying the knots are different, but we're not actually not so different. Evolutionary thinking, cultural evolution, we're in constant changes and progress through history, uh, development and improvement, of technology and tools. So not just the rock, we have the knife and now to the phone and now we have the digital ledger. So it's contextualized within a cultural economy. It means that improvements lineage and there's a definite start and a definite end. And there's some sort of idea that can be contributed to a colonial thinking, right? So the interesting, when you place this blockchain debate in the collectivization, decollectivization context, we're just asking two questions asset commoning or ownership authorship dependency. So for the first one, what resources or services should be seen as a common asset? So this question, the public private relationship. And the second one is, you know, should ownership trigger down into authorship in decision making? It's like what we have in co-housing, if you own a home, does it make you a decision maker? But how do you prevent monopoly in such a system? And also looking at scale. In Europe, it's 20 to 40 household per, uh, project and Hong Kong is 500 household per project. So how do we prevent a situation where minority is being robbed by majority in this collective decision? 
and how a peer-to-peer -peer digital economy like DAO compensate for the need for better distribution of resources, or is it just a fantasy of the tech? We're actually in a structuralism. We have the same fundamental problem. Uh, since a thousand years, it's the social political reality of the world for development. And why can't we solve this problem? So this is a brief summary of the history. We anchored on the framework in collectivization and decollectivization, which, which actually was um, imported from Soviet Union. So UBS in the Chinese cultural ontology is clothing, food, housing, and transport. And Confucian thinking is the rights and virtue. It's a process of collectivity and also a basic responsibility that's universal. As an agricultural civilization, all is provided by the land, by the mother. It's the yin in tai chi. So the distribution of heterogeneous finite resources uh, should be dynamic. It's actually not dichotomy between small and big commons. It's also the idea at the center of Sun's people's livelihood also during the land reform era in both nationalist and communist China. And then we went through the game of Dao Di Zhu, which simulates the periods of land reform and also to understand the challenge and problem that we're faced and the scale of the crisis that may affect the decision and also what uh, comes out of the decision. And then we went to rural marketization today. And then from rural to urban context, we look at the density of Hong Kong, which is 10 times scale in housing compared to Europe. And we're geographically very small, but proportionally every domestic project is big. So housing as a derivative of land as universal basic service in reaction to crisis, we keep pivoting between collectivization and privatization. So what are the other alternative where we can make collective decision for more, not just affordability, but livability. And then we reveal whether blockchain and DAO is actually a form of collectivization or is it more frictionalization within um, society. So thank you. And I hope this can provoke more uh, multicultural discussion later. And I would like to thank all my professors, which inspired me in many um, conversations. If you want to join our event, please scan this QR code and follow us. And uh, yeah, I am on Instagram 24 hours. So thank you so much. Thanks, uh, provides us uh, so rich again, so many things to, to, to get, get our teeth into. Um, I'll just bring in the other speakers. If you could turn your videos on, then I can uh, put you. Okay. There we go. Okay, so we've we've run a little bit over into the the, the question time. So um, I perhaps I I, I was going to start off with it's not the same question as such for all of you, but I think it kind of fits with each of your. Um, your presentations. And so I was wondering whether you could perhaps speak to this idea, perhaps uh, each of you. Um, and then if we have some questions from the audience, we can go there. Uh, and it was it was about a, a term that came up in both Andrew and Lawrence's, but I think it kind of fits with provides as well, is this idea of uh, compatibility or incompatibility of scales. So uh, all of you are talking about these different kinds of, of scales. I was thinking like Andrew, you've got um, you sort of you've got the different idea of, of, of spaces. So whether what to do with the, the image on the, the local, the distribution of images. Um, uh, you've got the idea of, of time. So whether you've got like a moment or an era, history, and then also just the different kinds of scale within the image. You know, do you have a big or small image? Well, and within the mechanism, so what's going on? So there's like lots of kind of different aspects of scale that kind of, and I was wondering, so like how, how do you conceptualize within those? And I feel like there's a similar kind of, in a sense, thing going on with, with Lawrence, where, sorry, where am I? So you, where you're talking about like physical scale, you know, you have like going from a sort of genetic uh, sort of engineering on the micro scale through the meso scale of, uh, of, of the humans and then you have this kind of planetary scale and then intergalactic scale uh, um, and then you also have, you also have these questions of cultural scales whether it's like the individual or the the family uh, the nation and then of course Hollywood comes into it uh, so there's, there's kind of these again different kind of scales and then that idea of cartographic scale um, with the maps that you talked about so again these different kinds of scales and I was wondering 
how that kind of works in your thought. And then finally, with provides where you talk about these kind of yeah, process uh, in, in your sort of summary of process, time, scale, and the movement from international, intranational, intercity, intra city. And, the, and then with the collectivization, you have sort of you've got the same kind of land, but then the scales of groupings, like we say, the household, uh, the collective, the nation, and then when you start talking about exporting suddenly we're into international so it seems to me that you're all talking about a number of different aspects of scale and i was wondering yeah how does how are these compatible or incompatible in each of your ways of conceiving of scale i hope that's that's kind of clear perhaps do you want andrew do you want to start there um yeah if i can uh if i've if i've, if I've understood you correctly um in a sense, okay, um, my paper is trying to just understand and to convince people of the importance of just a, this very basic thing. In, in a sense, it's not, I didn't even really um, theorize this. I'm just trying to kind of describe it. That, that, you know, this idea that photography is, and I have no uh, kind of essentialist, kind of media specific kind of definition of photography. It spans all sorts of activities, formations, discourses. Um, but they always involve some kind of constellation or concatenation of different issues of scale. So insofar as my paper was kind of, you might call it philosophical, it was in order to try and articulate that and, and, and argue, for, argue for its importance. But then that would only really produce um, kind of, knowledge or kind of epistemological critical purchase on specific contexts where attending to those other aspects of scale so having taken that scale is important attending to other aspects of scale would produce some kind of you know some kind of knowledge and um i guess in recent studies then i've so two israeli photographers uh mickey kratzman and shabtai penchevsky i wrote an article on those which is uh, a, a sort of a specific kind of not application, but is within this project, is looking at how they uh, visualize, use various different strategies uh, and, and processes of, of image making to visualize the landscape of the occupied territories um, at the moment. And then specifically the fate of various different Palestinian uh, uh, or Bedouin villages that are under threat of demolition. So there's a very specific context in which Thinking of that, there's a, I find a critical value of thinking of that in terms of the pressure put on various different forms of the establishment of proportion, disproportion, measure, unmeasure, various different applications of concrete or, 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 or conventional notions of scaling. So it's in, so it's like a, a yeah, what I've done today is to try and provide some kind of descriptive and or perhaps philosophical context for such studies i don't know if that's an answer to your question at all yeah thank you thank you uh lawrence yeah no no it's a really interesting question um because yeah in, in in general i guess the, the sort of central point and one that i'm trying to i guess upscale to like think about science fiction or popular cinema is the sort of um the way that narrative cinema kind of like resolves scale or re narrative resolution um happens on a, a specific sort of like um, human scale on a specific kind of like familial um, scale. Um, so with this, you know, obviously you have um, a film about the movement of a planet, but the the, res the beginning and the end, the resolution of the film happens on the scale of the family. Um, so all, 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 so all these narrative films descale, um, descale these sort of like planetary global visions. Um, I, I sort of, you know, thinking other films like, I mean, obviously this is, in the art film context, we can think of Lars von Trier's Melancholia. It's it's depression, right? So it's the planet hits the earth, and and that is depression hitting the person. So it's like it's resolved on that scale. Um, on one level, what's interesting is looking at these films for the sort of the excess and the sort of incompatibility, I guess, um, or the overflow, um, formal overflow. Obviously, Lars von Trier's film isn't just about depression it's also about the end of the world and and, and it's, the, those scales are really interestingly put together consciously 
um, looking at sort of popular films from, I sort of obliquely mentioned Armageddon, but you know, uh, The Wandering Earth as well, um, as sort of resolving these 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 cosmic dramas on the level of human drama, it's just is is an interesting way in which, you know, I guess you know, humans become the measure of all things, or, or these are sort of pure um, sort of speculative CGI devices for for just family dramas. But then sort of reading them as perhaps more interesting is sort of like, as you said, having that overflow and, and the wandering earth overflows with these images. So there's that level of incompatibility. But you spoke about um, then when I was talking about the kind of uh, physical space and scale. Um, on the one hand, that's a kind of what I was trying to frame as a kind of a formal intuition, a kind of in the film, something that doesn't quite make sense that we can maybe just as a heuristic for me to sort of expand out from this moment where it doesn't fit. There's a landscape and there's a map and it's it's bizarre and it's just an odd moment in the film um, to then think about a kind of like scalar confusion. I mean, more concretely, perhaps that moment happens because of an interesting difficulty of time scale as well, because we can also talk about time um, as a sort of, you know, the, 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 the novella is about one person's life. It's in the framing of sort of like um, um, a, a human life. And this is in the scale of a day. As film, you know, film sort of like bringing down the time scale, um, not not an ontological necessity for cinema, but 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 a sort of often commercial necessity for mm -hmm. um, film like this. Um, so in that sense, this moment is an interesting fudge of, of time scale because it's these. I mean, I've I've heard that you know if you if you do the measurements of how far they travel in the film, it makes no sense for like how long everything takes. It would take like days, and and it's just like an interesting, yeah. it, it, an impossibility for the film to try and contain all of its. Um, all of its events within a short amount of time. So there's a way in which I wanted to take that scale of scale, that register of scale, you might say, the sort of formal register of scale to think about this sort of like narrative register of scale. Um, yeah, as I said, formal intuition or like a, a slippage, mm. that's a productive slippage, I guess. Um, and I, I, I have a question for Andrew, but I'll, I'll, if that's okay, but after, after provides maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As it just, I was just, um, it makes me think of also whether there's a certain medium specificity that or like yeah. you said the commercial thing because when you mentioned the the time it takes it makes me think of the um what people talk about is it fast and furious five or six where they have that that plane taking off which lasts for about half an hour and it's it's like the <laughs> runway would have to be like 30 miles long or something in order for the scene <laughs> to actually make any kind of physical sense so you get to the yeah. is there something necessarily about like commercial cinema or or mm. kind of the, the necessities of a narrative that, yeah. that ends up bringing this kind of metaphorical Con uh, a constellation that is inevitably kind of collapsing on a scalar level mm, yeah uh, and yeah, no and, and, and then what makes me think immediately of like tv series and the different scale that happens there and like science fiction television series happens along a could happen um along a sort of longer period of time or, or there, there's something about length and time and what happens in two hours versus what happens in 10 hours and yeah no, that's <laughs> yeah. fascinating yeah yeah so perhaps it, prov it provides if you I mean, to just to well. add on to that conversation, because um, we also do a lot about uh, follometric cinema in uh, our current collective. Mm -hmm. And the whole outset is that we're no longer in the frame to frame sort of transition, but we're in world to world. So everything you see from VR, AR, or any sort of 3D technology, you navigate through a storyline and a narrative as opposed to montage and superimpose the image to you. Mm -hmm. So when I first saw the question of scale, I thought, well, why are we talking about that, you know, for this conference? And now I realize, well, it's actually a condition of our world, uh, of our environment, of our world, a way for us to actually understand from photography, the image to cinematology, and even to the navigation of a more three-dimensional environment. But um, to bring that into the Chinese thinking, I guess we've always understand ourselves as a cosmos. So we look at the sky, we see the star, we map that on the geography, we call that sacred geography. And then from that, we map it to our human body. So this would be the mountain and then we have the river and blah, blah. So it's always this idea uh, in Chinese medicine and it is everyday uh, practice, but the term scale just never came up in our language. Mm -hmm. And even family, uh, country and the cosmo, it's like the three scale, but actually the idea of the nation state was imported. So we never saw it as that sort of scale problem. And because we never start off from the individual, we've always started from the large complex 
way of thinking about Cosmo. We never had that scalability issue because we were always at the big scale sort of perspective. We never thought, well, if just peer to peer, can we be scalable? Um, especially when we do a lot of research in blockchain scalability is like the word for everyone. If you can't scale, if you can process faster than Visa or MasterCard, there's no value for it in the world, right? So I guess sometimes when we look too much from um, this peer to peer, we lose the bigger picture. And I think going back to this history actually helped me at least to actually understand, well, actually we need to start from big and go to small. And from that, do we still have the question of complex system if we you know, go the other way of uh, scaling down? So I guess, yeah. Mm. Yeah, th that's really interesting. If, if I can just follow up, it, 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 it's interesting that many of the conversations we've had uh, so far in the conference, particularly in relation to something like climate change, have often been framed in this idea of like the individual to the planetary. And it, if, if what you're saying is that so within the kind of Chinese context, it's less focused on the individual. And so you have this kind of uh, civilization, you know, like say about the, the nation state being imported. And so like, do, are you able, is there anything kind of specific that you would say about that context that changes the way in which scale in terms of say climate change or pandemics, you know, the global pandemics are kind of conceptualized that is then different from that uh, very Western kind of individual yeah. to the large scale. I mean, I, I tried to make it short. I think it's very difficult to talk about this in English. Okay. <laughs> because the Chinese word, when it's translated into English, it sounds so meaningless. I'm sorry, yes. my, my, my no, Mandarin no, no, no. Or Cantonese it's, is, is yeah, it's non-existent. <laughs> We, we all struggle with, right? So we do a lot uh, of state scale intervention. And uh, it's almost like what we would call as top down as opposed to a bottom up. But um, can we just go to the next question? Before okay, no worries. Yeah, I try, try to. Um, thank you very much in any case. Yeah, I just tried to throw too many things in, 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 at once. Uh, Lawrence, uh, you said that you, you had a, a question you wanted to, to ask. Yeah, I mean, it might just be sort of a bit garbled thoughts, but I thought, yeah, to, to Andrew, your, that photograph, I, I, the, the, the sort of unknown photograph that you've shown was yeah. really fascinating. Because the thing that really struck me at first was, um, and I, maybe this is sort of, as you said in the article um, that, you, that you wrote about it, but is is the the ruler not being set to zero on the sh shiv or the, the, the sort of um, implement, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it, I don't know, already I'm sort of, I, already I was kind of thinking about the difference between measure as in, as in that as a sort of measuring scale of operation and as an object among many. Um, and then I was also thinking of the kind of, um, I mean, you have, as you said, you sort of trace it back to sort of prisons and, and this question of justice. And so, and the sort of, the, this being a sort of like, um, um, a kind of uh, uh, this, the photograph as being a kind of mugshot, and of course, mugshot is about scale. You have the measurement behind you in a mugshot, usually correct, um, to sort of work out height. But then also the scales of justice, right? Because you have um, justice, but, you know, the, the idea that this is a photograph of prison and that these are confiscated objects, alongside the scale of the sort of different scale of justice or sort of. Um, rogue justice within a prison which would have necessitated punishment such as that using the implement so you have the sort of scale of justice if that's the right way of putting it all different scales of justice um mm -hmm. weighed up within the prison and this this knife this sort of instrument for in exacting that kind of you know, rogue justice or something um and state justice of the prison um so i don't know i i, I don't know that i mean that, that's just so many things that, that, that were fascinating about that and i was wondering then how that might link to this idea of the trans individuality of, of 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 those ideas of sort of um of of you know the way we 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 um equate uh justice or state justice with like universal justice when you have these different scales of justice and the scales of justice if, if that makes any sense sorry i thought it was yeah brilliant but no 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 it does it does um so is that you know that this is kind of, you just very very nicely better than I kind of articulated why I call this kind of abyss that nobody wants to look into. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that there's often really a lie in when one begins to think about this, this kind of what I, I don't know, it was a little bit overblown, but the promiscuous dullness 
of this kind of concatenation of, of, of scales. I mean, I think you, you articulate that very, very nicely. And what's important about what you said was that it, it doesn't, it's not just a, like some formal engine or kind of, you know, some um, game in, a, in, a, in an irrelevant sense. It very quickly leads one to, you know, like in your, like in your description, to, to the to the ethical grounds of the difference between, you know, institutionalized state uh, justice and other more informal kind of ways, you know, like you, you say rogue justice, like, the, you know, why do people, what do, what do people use shivs in, uh, in prison for? And it so very quickly brings you up against such questions that are connected, hopefully, you know, uh, to, to through this concern for, you know, constellations of scale to how the forms of representation involved work there, how the ideas of um, measure or proportionality uh, are kind of weighted or maybe kind of, you know, uh, uh, ideologically slanted. So hopefully it leads one into those, uh, uh, into, into having to, having to, to think about, to, to deal with those questions and then to do so seriously. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, but having said, I mean, the thing is that I think there's a little bit of a sleight of hand on my part, and there's something slightly disingenuous about my use of that image to be sort of self-critical for a while, um, is that I said, it, well, it's got a, this kind of promiscuous dullness, but it's not actually very dull. <laughs> it's quite a striking image. Now, I think I should have used a far duller image in a sense, but I, I, I mean, I don't know. Partly it's, it's just kind of so, I find it, you know, it's kind of fascinating on all sorts of different levels. But, um, but yeah, maybe I don't know if that constitutes an ad adequate response to your, to, to, your, to your kind of so, comment. Thank you so much. So we've run over a little bit, but if you, I do have one more question. If if no, if no one, if you don't mind holding on for a little bit. Um, so the I was really struck by um, Lawrence, your your description of, of when you had the, um, the the earth and then kind of moving past and the sun kind of comes past it. Um, and sorry, where you sort of see it as, as the earth moves, moves, moves past and, and the sun kind of shines into the camera. And, and you describe this as, as kind of excessive. And I was wondering, um, and I thought this maybe fitted with some of the other uh, other things that um, provides and, and, and Andrew were talking about, like what, what does excessive kind of mean? Because uh, provides you kept talking about like Hong Kong as this like, like this, this density of, of, of population and and how there seems to be a certain kind of depending on what it's been compared to, depending on the scale we're talking about, there's this kind of idea of excessiveness. Which could be again to go back to my first, you know, like first question, kind of about is it physical? Is it sort of experiential? Is it is there some kind of cultural thing uh, going on there? And and I was just thinking about it in terms of like the way DeCalio and Horton talk about scalar thresholds and this idea of like sort of are, are we talking about it kind of exceeding a, a scalar threshold and in that way like not being sort of perceivable within a threshold so that where they say you know one this kind of differences that make a difference so if you go into another scale of threshold you exceed a certain scale things are no longer sort of perceptible in the same way like a body if we go down to the nano scale then the body is, is, is exceeds that scale and therefore it's no longer kind of perceptible in that way so i was just wondering perhaps particularly particularly Lawrence but I don't know whether that speaks to you provides uh, this idea of, of, of excess is that kind of useful term to think through what's going on with scale um, sorry long question but... no, I think that's I think that's I think that's really really interesting because yeah I mean uh, excessive can be an excessive term you know or it could be a kind of like term that, that that stops losing meaning unless you um unless you sort of like scale it um as in talk about sort of like on what uh, what is being exceeded according to what perspective what scale right yeah. um and in some sense, obviously, images of um, grand CGI images of the Earth within science fiction are not excessive. They're exactly what you have to do. They're, they're generic. You, you know, that is, a, that is a shot that has existed within science fiction films um, varying to CGI standards um, for years. Right. So in that sense, it's not excessive, although it's, it's generically excessive in the sense that um, you watch a film knowing that an excessive amount of money has been spent. Um, um, making it right so there's a sort of like an excessiveness there that's sort of like necessary um, the excessiveness that I was trying to theorize as well from the specific 
um, notion of sort of like exceeding scale is 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 I guess in is is in the sense of if this is in the sense as I was talking about the sort of like we spoke about the incompatibility of the the, the, the national family scale and the planetary scale um, and so trying to see those images as as exceeding or trying to see those images as exceeding the sort of like simple bounds by which it becomes a state melodrama or family melodrama and of course that's a really difficult question actually so like, I mean yeah I think your question was really on it and like you know I, it helps me try to understand how you would how you would try to make that move to say um although obviously this film resolves itself in a narrative to um not return but sacrifice um from the father fa fa the patriarchal sacrifice um try to think about how those images are something over and above um function function in excess of a sort of re-territorialization to the family they function um to produce a kind of planetary consciousness um, that exceeds um, a national coding, if that makes sense. But it's, yeah, it's really important. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question. Thank mm. you. Yeah, oh, that's, that's great, thank you. So it provides, is that, is that a helpful question to, for, for your project or, or, or not? I, I guess I would try to synthesize the last question with this one. Um, I don't have okay. like one big answer for the climate change and the justice that we were discussing and also <laughs> the access. But for instance, we have a project uh, in China right now, it's the nationwide project is poverty elevation, alleviation. We have a lot of villages, uh, people who don't even have roads to access, they were climbing on ropes to cross the river. So that's reality because of this large scale, we have a spectrum of economic abilities, right? So what they do right now also is that some of these people, they live in so far away deep in the forest and then they're like, they, they have plastic. So they will sort of damage their surrounding area. So we have this project where we try to move people to where it's better for them to live. So not in the mountainous, maybe also where they can farm. Um, and within the conversation, we easily enter the uh, area of control and surveillance um, and large scale planned environment. But actually, if we go back to history in uh, the ancient tradition, we have Diao Zhuang. It's amazing. It's like the entire village, you hook it up and then you move it somewhere else. Okay. It's a practice for 2000 years. Um, yeah, especially in some uh, ethnic minority uh, towards the West, yeah. So it's the idea of access, uh, excessive control or not enough control if we talk about it in the system sense, right? Like for instance, um, in cybernetics, when Norbert Weiner made that moth machine to simulate Parkinson, and then he realized that actually Parkinson, the neuro disease, is from excessive signals from the brain, uh, between the brain and the body. So you keep like this. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess this within a cosmology thinking to the human body is the same. If you have a lot of signals and you have a lot of control, everything becomes uh, white noise. So it's a matter of how to balance or homogenize uh, what the Chinese thinking would be saying, not to tame nature, but sometimes it's actually to tame ourselves, right? Yeah, so you know, to escape the conversation of control and surveillance, perhaps. Thank you. So, um... Oh yeah, the uh, Magdalene is saying uh, wonderful papers. Thanks so much uh, to everyone. So I think on that note, um, unless there's anything particularly you'd like to add, I think we will we will wrap up. So thank you to our audience uh, for coming coming and watching. Um, thank you to all three of you, Andrew, Lawrence, and Provides for really rich papers. I'm sorry we couldn't get into all the details of everything. Uh, I think we'd be here till uh, uh, till the end of the day. Um, but oh, thank you once again. Um, if you would like to join us um, this afternoon or wherever where time zone you're in, in a couple of hours, we have Bogna Konyor, um, who will be uh, speaking on a number of different, different things. Um, so thanks again, uh, goodbye, and uh, perhaps see some of you later. Thank you so much. Thank you.